And now the author joins us live from Dallas to take your calls and your tweets. Mrs. Shepard, thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you very much for the invitation. I appreciate it. it in your view, if the Matthew Shepard Act were passed into law, what would be the effect? Well, the first thing is it's going to send a great message of respect to, uh, to the world about how the government feels about the gay community. Um, you know, we can't prevent crime, or we wouldn't need prisons if we could do that, if laws were that effective. Uh, but it definitely sends a message of respect that we recognize that this is an issue. And once we establish the laws, people's minds change. Uh, they begin to understand that this is sort of something out of their control, that this is the right thing to do. And from this step, we just hope to incrementally get better. What is exactly in the legislation? Well, it expands existing civil rights uh, hate crime laws to include sexual orientation, uh, gender identity and expression, gender and disability. We already have hate crime laws uh, on the books from the civil rights era in the 60s that protect uh, race, ethnicity and religion. We just want to expand the groups and also the government parameters to include uh, functionality of the government grants to help communities finance the investigations and the trials. Um, and to allow the government sometimes, if they think it's necessary, to step in and, and uh, help prosecute or even investigate. Judy Shepard is our guest. This is the cover of the book, The Meaning of Matthew, My Son's Murder in Laramie and a World Transformed. If you've been watching C-SPAN, you just saw her presenting on her book from Salt Lake City. 202 is the area code if you'd like to talk with Mrs. Shepard. 737-0001 for those of you in the east and central time zones. 202-737-0002 for the mountain and Pacific time zones. And you can send Mrs. Shepard a tweet also. Twitter.com slash book TV. The first call up is from Idaho Falls, Idaho. Joy, go ahead with your question for Judy Shepard. Jo Good morning, Joy. Um, I just happened to catch just the last little bit of your program, and the one gentleman had asked about um, how to deal with his parents and letting them know who he is. And I am very fortunate to have a brother that is gay. He does live in the Salt Lake community, but he is so loved by all his family. There's just, I mean, it's such a great loss for somebody to not want to have that person around them just because of who they are. Yeah, I don't understand it either. They're, all our children are wonderful, and, and uh, to, to reject one because of their sexual orientation just makes no sense to me. Next call comes from Alan in Baltimore, Maryland. Alan, you're on the air with Judy Shepard. Okay, hello. How are you doing? Hi, Alan. Uh, yes, uh, I'm a gay man. And uh, I'm, no practice, I'm no longer practicing uh, the gay lifestyle because of the Bible. Also, uh, the Catholic Church teaches in the Catechism, and I'm not officially Catholic yet. I may be at some point in time. But here's the thing. It talks about the disorder of it. Now, here's the thing. I know the disorder very well. When you're 58 years old and you don't know whether you're a man or a woman, you are screwed up inside of yourself psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, and everything else. And it has really screwed up my life in terms of uh, my weaknesses and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so my question is this. Are you going to make uh, help to make the Bible illegal in the United States of America in terms of uh, we're no longer to, uh, allowed to criticize people? We're, we have to, we, as soon as you criticize a gay man, you're bigoted, you're prejudiced, and all that kind of stuff. Judy Shepard, you spoke in your presentation in Salt Lake about religion and your views on it. If you could just repeat a little bit of that for us. Sure. Um, the, everyone has, everyone, no matter what their sexual orientation, certainly has the right to worship no matter what, and no one has the right to tell anyone where they can or cannot worship, gay or straight. Um, my understanding of the Bible is that you're supposed to love your fellow man. Now, I'm not a scholar, nor a particularly religious person. I regard myself more as spiritual. Um, it's, uh, I, I'm very happy for people who find their lives uh, intertwined with a religion of some sort, with a church that is loving and accepting. I'm, I'm particularly sorry for your situation, Alan. I, everything you've said is certainly, you know, your free choice, free will, free opinion. The laws you're talking about have nothing to do with words. 
there is a, actually specific language in the current hate crime bill uh, waiting to be passed that addresses speech. This is not about speech at all. It's about actions. Um, so I'm, I'm not any part of a conspiracy trying to make the Bible illegal. Far from it. I'm a, I, I would never do that. Free speech is a, a, an amazing thing, but this does not address free speech. But thank you for your comments. Mrs. Shepard, in your book, you talk quite a bit about the fact that you never saw yourself uh, as a public speaker or, or being in this position. Do you get a lot of people who uh, have that kind of question for you? You know, I, I really don't. Um, I don't. And I have actually been getting more of them on the phone than I do in person. Uh, maybe they're more comfortable doing it that way than in person. Uh, I think people who come to see me, who, where, I, where I'm invited to speak, are mostly uh, thinking along the same lines as us. We, we tend to be the choir, so to speak, uh, and even the choir needs to rehearse, that's fine. The message extends beyond my being there in person. The audience takes the message away with them, and that's really, that's really the goal. The criticisms, yes, come in via mail or email, mostly anonymously. Um, but, it, you know, religion is a very personal, difficult to understand subject for a lot of people. And the church is a very painful uh, reminder to many in the gay community that they are not accepted there. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's really sad. It's a, it's a heartbreaking situation. The one place you think you can go and be accepted for who you are and they shut the doors in your face is, is a heartbreaking situation. What was the process like for you to write this book? Oh, it was hard. It was really hard. I wasn't sure I was even ready to do it or that I ever could do it. It's not something I even wanted to do uh, initially. I had something else in mind. Uh, I'm glad I did it. It's been very therapeutic and cathartic, and it actually opened the floodgates to many wonderful memories about Matt that we had sort of not, you know, not thought about it. It not only reminded us of the joy that he was in our lives, but also the things that he used to do that would annoy us endlessly. Uh, so it's, it's been really uh, uplifting, enlightening, and funny. You know, to talk about him, uh, talk about him in that way again. We, we miss him terribly. It's, we really miss him. Betty in Big Arm, Montana. You're on with Judy Shepard. Judy, this is the first time I've heard you speak or seen you, and I really appreciate uh, what you are doing. Uh, I was in Fort Collins, Colorado, when Matt was in the hospital, just a few miles away. I went to the homecoming parade of Colorado State University. And there was a dreadful travesty on one of the yeah. floats sponsored by a fraternity and a sorority making fun of Matthew. It looked like I, I, it went by fast, and I, I didn't understand what I was seeing. And I wandered over to the hospital and just went around the hall praying for Matt. Uh, thank you. I want to thank you for, for what you're doing. Well, thank you, Betty. Thank you for your call. Barb. Actually, that, uh, Go ahead. that homecoming parade, if I may, mm -hmm. that float definitely was uh, making fun of Matt. And the fraternity who, who produced that float, they actually had their charter pulled. Uh, Judy Shepard, you talk about in the book where you flew back from Saudi Arabia, got to Fort Collins where Matt was in the hospital, and there was a, there was a rally or a prayer vigil that night. And you, in the book, you talk about how you kind of resented it almost. You know, I did. I, we had no concept of what was really going on. Our minds were totally focused on Matt and his condition and our family. Uh, we could have cared less what was going on outside that hospital room. And it seemed very invasive and intrusive on our own private lives. You, you never want your private life to be part of national news, and especially when you're just Joe Citizen. You know, we never aspired to be. We weren't celebrities. We weren't even known by anybody but family and friends. It, was, it seemed very intrusive. I don't think we even realized it in its totality until well after Matt's uh, funeral services. You also wrote that while you were at the hospital, you received a call from President Clinton. Yeah, that was pretty amazing. The hospital administrator was just beside himself with anxiety, and he came looking for Dennis. The president's on the phone. Dennis says, I don't care who's on the phone. I'm not leaving Matt. And uh, the administrator was going, but it's the president. Dennis goes, I don't care if it's the president. Finally. He talked us into it. Dennis spoke to him as President Clinton was very gracious and generous, warm. He also addressed, uh, he spoke to Logan. Um, he's written personal notes to, to the family. He was, he was really amazing support. Uh, Matthew Shepard was attacked on October 6, 1998 and died on October 12, 1998. Barb.